in many years. Many of these are our old coal mining towns that, you know, are left with these beautiful caves and these hiking trails, and they continue to expand on these to draw people in. In many cases, because of where they are, you know, kind of mountainous regions, you know, there's not going to be a, a huge draw for, for larger industries to come, unfortunately. So they have to rely on what they have, which is their beautiful natural heritage. And so we do need to preserve those things. We need to make sure that we that our federal government is setting aside money for for those public spaces, those public lands, so that the local communities can can apply for the grants and receive the grants to actually build those places out and make them an income sustainer as well. It's also important that we recognize that these open spaces really only can be preserved if we also have the environmental protections that are put in place to make sure that we're not pollu- that we're not polluting that we are not clear cutting trees so if we intentionally focus on these public lands and these public spaces we can actually preserve an economic builder for some of these more rural communities as well as preserve our natural heritage and it's some of the most beautiful spaces you would ever you would ever want to visit. So I encourage you, come on out to Grundy County or Van Buren County and check out some of our, our public faces out here. All right. Excellent. Well, is there anything else that you want to make sure that our listeners know about you or about your campaign? I think that one of the reasons why our campaign has been so effective is because I really understand who the people are in the district and what their life experience is because I've lived it. My dad Uh, worked for a company since the time he was 18 years old until the time he was 51. His corporation made the business decision to let, you know, to, to fire all of the managers who didn't have a college degree. Now, my dad had worked his way up with his company and found himself out of work. 51 years old, no college degree, no job available for him. He spent the next several years looking for something comparable, but it's hard. He now actually works on an oil rig in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. He's a safety supervisor out there. He's 63 years old. He's battling melanoma, hoping one day to to retire. Stories like these are the stories of people in my district, people who work hard every day, who set goals, who do whatever they need to to get ahead, and sometimes, for no fault of their own, a factory closes or a hospital closes. They deserve to have the respect, you know, that their hard work has given them. And they need to have somebody in Washington who understands their stories, who's going to fight for those stories, because they're not just data sheets on, on a spreadsheet, but they're actually human beings that are, that are struggling. So I'm proud to have the endorsement of people that know those struggles. Like, I've been endorsed by the People's House Project who stands for bringing the house back to the people. I've also received the endorsement of Representative Bob Clement, who had been a a congressman from Tennessee, representing these people and their values for many years. Rachel Held Evans, who is a faith leader, she actually was in the Obama administration as one of his faith advisors. She's a voter in my district. She's been a, a supporter of my campaign. And I love that I have her endorsement as well as somebody who's really going to fight for, for the people of the district. And then, of course, the AFL-CIO and um, the building trades, people that work hard every day, they know I'm going to work hard for them. So um, I did want to really share that with you because, you know, I'm a, I'm a working class girl who's now running for Congress. And I have the skill, I have the ability, I have the knowledge, and I also have the, the understanding of where the people in my district are coming from and what they need. So the last thing I I really can say is we can win this race. In Tennessee 4, we can win this race. Scott Desjardins, the incumbent that's in office right now, he's not very popular. We are connecting to voters. We are identifying what they need, and we are standing up for them every single day. What I really need is support to really get the word out, let people know across the country that you know, that race, this race is winnable. And if anybody wants to help us get a little further, there's postcards they can write, there's phone calls they can do, of course, contributions they can make to uh, help us get a little further. They can go to my website at mariah4congress.com. 
and uh, check us out. All right, great. And we will put links uh, to your website and social media up on our website as well. I I have way too many campaign t-shirts at this point, but I really love your t-shirts. Thank you. Thank you. I had a friend that designed my logo and I was, I'm very proud of them. She did a great job. Yeah, I love it. All right. Well, thank you so, so much uh, for talking with me today. This has been really great. And I know early voting has already started for the primaries. So if you're in Tennessee 4 or anywhere in Tennessee, make sure you go out and vote. Thank you so much. My name is Mariah Phillips. I'm working hard for the hardworking people at Tennessee 4. And I'd love to have your support. Thank you. junkies. Are you having a tough time navigating the twists and turns of the Trump-Russia investigation? So to be clear, you want easily digestible and succinct reporting on the Mueller investigation? That's what he said. That's what I said. That's obviously what our position is. It's time you check out Mueller She Wrote. Mueller She Wrote is a weekly podcast where three female comics take a deep dive into the most consequential investigation in modern political history. I'm your host, A.G., and I have to remain anonymous because I work for Trump's executive branch. Join me, along with Jaleesa Johnson and Jordan Coburn, as we report the facts, break exclusive news, and bring it all to you with just the right amount of snark. Then we top it off with our Fantasy Indictment League, exclusive interviews from guests including Asha Rangappa, Chris Cluey, Rabia Oshadri, and Scott Stedman, followed by conjecture, all while we speculate on who is... <laughs> Fuck. So tune in for consistent updates and reliable coverage on Manafort, Cohen, the Trump family, Russia, and everything Mueller, and make Mondays great again. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Mueller She Wrote. And check out our website at MullerSheWrote.com. You'll be glad you did. Today, I'm here with Justin Canoe, who is running for Congress in the Tennessee 7th District. Hi, Justin. Hi, Kelly. How are you? I'm great. How are you in Tennessee? I'm good. It's a little humid and hot, but we're getting by and uh, we're coming up to our primary date here. So things are really picking up around here right now. Yeah, I'm sure. All right. So let's start with a little bit of background. Tell me a little bit about who you are and how you got to this point where you've decided to run for Congress. Sure. So the first thing I should say is that I'm not a career politician, that I've never thought about doing this before in my entire life. But there was this election that happened in 2016 that you may have heard about. And I felt like after that, this country was heading in a dangerous direction and that everybody needed to do everything we could. And so the thing that I was going to do was go help whoever was going to run against our representative here, Marsha Blackburn, who's been in that seat for 16 years. I have a two-year-old baby girl. I just felt like Marshall Blackburn was not representing the the family spirit that I see here every single day. And so I went looking to help whoever was going to run against Marsha. I couldn't find that person, so I became that person. That was a little over a year ago. Since then, we've raised about $260,000 in grassroots donations. I'm not taking any PAC money or special interest money. We've been traveling through this very gerrymandered district, talking to people who don't agree with us about everything, and just really trying to be a bridge builder and remind people that extremism and division is not healthy for this country. So it's been a really rewarding journey. And since then, Marsha Blackburn has decided to run for Senate. I like to say I scared her off. So she's Phil Bredesen's problem now. And the seat is open. And on the other side of the aisle, they're running somebody who is even more extreme and divisive than Marsha is. So I feel like if we get our message out there of a return to civility and you know some of the ideals that we're standing for, I think that we can really convert some people who maybe feel like this party, this GOP is not their party anymore, the way in its current form. And, you know, we're going to do our best to motivate the base, but at the same time, have a conversation with the people who maybe have an issue with the D next to my name and show them at the end of the day, the D stands for decency more than anything else. Let's talk a little bit then about the 7th District. So you mentioned that it's gerrymandered. It looks like it was designed to sort of cut out Nashville. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It was designed to keep Marsha Blackburn in that seat, and it did its job for a very, very long time. Uh, I like to say it looks like a grizzly bear doing a split. 19 <laughs> counties, 
it covers the area south of Nashville, north of Nashville, and then almost to Memphis. So it's very gerrymandered. Area-wise, it's big, and it's been a lot of miles on the car, so much so that my wife at a certain point, about four months into this thing, said, you got to go rent a truck. So we rented a truck in November or so, and uh, we put a lot of miles on that thing. So (laughs) we've been doing our best to get out there into the rural parts of this district. And the makeup of it, it's sort of three different parts. There's Williamson County, which is one of the more affluent counties in the state and in the country, really. And then there's Clarksville and Montgomery County, which has Fort Campbell, which is very military focused. And then there are 17 other counties that are very rural and uh, some of them not doing so great. So, you know, to be in one part of this district is to be in one part of this district. And there are sort of different issues facing different aspects of it. And so the Cook Partisan Voter Index has this as an R plus 20, which is pretty Republican. Do you think yes. that that is accurate or is there an issue of voter turnout? You know, what do you sort of see as your, your path to being able to win in a district like that? Well, let me just start by saying that I've already raised more money than the last six Democrats combined. So on some level, part of the story that we're telling ourselves is that we haven't really tried in a very long time. Marsha's had a cakewalk. And so we've really already mounted more of a campaign than we've had in a very long time. I don't want to oversell how conservative this place is. You know, there are definitely conservatives here, but Williamson County in particular voted for Rubio in the primary. So I believe that even though it's conservative and Republican, that at its core, Williamson County especially, which is one of the more populous areas, is a more moderate strain of conservatism. And I do believe that if we can show them that Mark Green, who I'm running against, is too extreme for them. He's too, he was too extreme for the Trump administration. He was a huge Roy Moore supporter down in Alabama, a vocal supporter of his. And so I just think, just like that D next to my name doesn't define me necessarily, I don't think the R tells you who everybody is here either. And there are plenty of transplants that come to the Nashville area, especially recently, and people are awake right now. You know, I was going to county party meetings even before the election, and they were not as well attended as they are now. There's an energy here throughout the district and throughout the country. And so I'm hopeful that something like we saw with Connor Lamb will happen here. You know, I, again, I understand that the hill is steep, but I really believe if there was ever a time that now's the time, especially with Phil Bredesen in the race for Senate, that really helps lift, lift everybody's boat because Phil Bredesen is a Democrat who Republicans like. He carried all 95 counties when he was reelected governor here. And so I believe that we can draft off of his coattails a little bit. And if we do the work that we're doing here and we are really putting in a lot of work, I don't know if, if you follow us on Facebook or, or anywhere else, but you know, we just finished a 19 county, 19 day tour through the district. And we've been to all the counties multiple times, really trying to get out there and meet as many people as we possibly can. And I think Tennessee, it is conservative, but I really believe that people here want a return to civility. They want to get back to listening to each other. And, and I think it's not necessarily as extreme as some of those Cook reports and some of those stats would tell you. And so what are some of the issues that really concern you and that as you're going around the 19 counties that it really concern the voters? Well, I think number one is health care. I believe that everybody should be covered in this country. I just yesterday or two days ago actually was in Columbia, Tennessee, where remote area medical came. And I don't know if you know what that is, but it's basically a nonprofit that used to go to third world countries and bring health care to people who don't have access to it. But then they realized there was a need for it here in our country. And so they've been going around to American cities. And so two days ago, they were here in Columbia, Tennessee, which is part of our district. And we showed up at 5 a.m. And there was already a huge line through the parking lot of people who don't have coverage, don't have care. We saw a similar thing throughout the district as we traveled it this past June. So the idea that we have Americans who are forced to line up in parking lots at 3 a.m. just to get coverage, just to be seen, is something that I think all Americans should feel saddened by, and it's something that we all need to deal with. So that's one that resonates no matter where we are. Health care, health coverage for everybody is something that I want to be there for. I want to be there to cast a vote for that to happen. I want to join that fight. And then the economy and jobs is a big deal. I think everything's tied together, but you know, to tie the health care to the jobs – Medicaid expansion here in our state didn't happen. And the guy that I'm running against, Mark Green, was a big part of the reason why he helped block Medicaid expansion in our state, which kept $23 billion out of our state over the course of a decade. 
$5 billion and counting so far. We've had a lot of rural hospital closures here. 